Do you have a Bible? Do you read the Bible? What is your favorite Bible text or Bible verse? At every celebration of Mass, Catholics hear the expression, the word of the Lord, to which all respond, thanks be to God, affirming that what is heard is indeed the word of God. What do Catholics understand by the word, the word of God, and the word of the Lord? When Catholics say the word of God, are we always referring to the Bible? Is there a difference between sacred scriptures and the Bible? It is not unusual to hear the expressions, the Catholic Bible or Catholic Bible and a Protestant Bible. Is there a difference? I consider myself very privileged to have had early contact with the Bible. I attribute this to my maternal grandmother who was a Methodist and whose custom it was to introduce her grandchildren to the scriptures. While my memory of what she demanded is vague, I was given Psalm 19, a wisdom psalm, to memorize and to recite at some stage for my grandmother. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows forth the work of his hands. Day unto day utter speech, night unto night show knowledge. And ending in verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. While I did not know it at the time, I believe that this um, helped to shape my own disposition toward God. In my young adult life, my grandmother also introduced me to Romans 8, a favorite text of hers. And the last verses, verses 38 and 39, are on my ordination card. For I'm certain of this, neither death nor life, no angel, no prince, nothing that exists, Nothing still to come, no power, no height, no depth can come between us and the love of God made visible in Christ Jesus the Lord. Father Vibert, I'm happy to share this Bible moment, this Bible conversation with you. Now I have mentioned the expressions Catholic Bible and Protestant Bible. Is there really a difference or um, are we talking about the same reality? Yes, so we can say both Catholic and Protestant uses more or less the same scripture but with some fundamental differences. And let me locate the Bible in two ways. We have what we call a Palestinian text written in Hebrew and we have another text that was translated when the Jews were sent into exile. So they want to have the language of the scripture in the language of the people that they live among after many centuries, since many of them did not know Hebrew. Therefore it was translated in Greek. That is called the Septuagint. Now, while they were in exile, they also continue to write their story about how God has been with them on the journey. And as a result of that, several other books, seven to be exact, were included in the Septuagint. So for instance, the book of Tobit, Judith, Esther, Maccabees, and so on. And so these books were mentioned, uh, were placed within the what we call the canon of scripture because they contain the experience of the people that God did not stop journeying with them when they were in Palestine. But God continued to be with them in exile. Now, those books are very important from a Catholic standpoint. And they may 
in the past, I say me in the past, would have had very little value for the Protestants. For Catholics, they were very important because, first of all, the book not only records the difficulty, the persecution, and so on, and the struggles the Jewish people experienced during their time in exile, but it mentioned, for instance, three significant points. The first is what we call intercession, intercessory prayer. And we have, for instance, one of the Jews in Maccabees who were leading the rebellion had a vision in which he saw one of the saints that had passed, Jeremiah, and Ominous, I think the name is, lifting up their hands and praying before God for the people of Israel during their suffering. Then we also ha had not just the intercession, but the praying for the dead. Now what is all that about? It is customary among the Gentiles that during a time of war, persons who are killed were left to the key, are just burnt, and their remains stay there. Many of the Jews were slaughtered, and many of of the, the people, knowing the importance of life, the importance of the human body, and had a vision of something else with God, decided that they were going to do something. They were going to gather an, an offering or collection so that they can bury the dead, even under assault by the enemy. Because they believed that the body was made by God, that the human person is not just flesh and blood, but the whole being were created and were very important for the divine. And therefore, they felt that they must give honor. So they took the bodies and gave them a proper burial. Because they believe that God who gave them life will one day again give them um, and someday in the afterlife or the resurrection give them life again. That takes me into the most important points about those books. So we have the book of, for instance, Tobit or Maccabees mentioning about burying the dead and the, the importance of the sacredness of the, the person who died. But also we have the mention about the resurrection. So though in the Hebrew text, we have mention of the afterlife or the resurrection. These books were very explicit. For instance, we know the story in the book of Maccabees of the mother who witnessed her seven sons being slaughtered in different ways under persecution. And she encouraged her, son, her sons not to give up but to offer their body because they must not divert from obeying what God wants them to do. And that the God who gave her life and enabled her to bring them into the world will also give them life on the day of resurrection. That is wonderful. Now, from the standpoint of the Protestant, you will know that intercessory, um, rather praying for the dead, is a fundamental problem. Say, when you're dead, you're done. But here we have some scripture that are considered valid and inspired by the Lord, that here is mentioned about praying for those who have departed. Here we have the intercession of saints. Jeremiah died many centuries ago. And yet we have Jeremiah in heaven, as it were, offering up praise for those who are not. So, the, the books are fundamentally different from the standpoint of what we have in also included from the Greek standpoint into the text itself. So, Father Mike, we are dealing 
fundamentally what we call canon of scripture. And the canon of scripture is a collection that is considered authoritative, that are considered um, inspired and to be used in the assembly. Now, the Hebrew text does not include the seven books and therefore it's a shorter canon. The Greek text is a longer canon because it includes these books. Theologically, Protestant choose or even Catholic choose the canon to prove or to establish particular theological point. Since praying for the dead and so on is not emphasized in the, in the Hebrew canon, Protestant therefore follow the pattern that there is no need to pray for the dead. Catholics on the other hand know of a tradition that offers prayer for the dead and therefore gravitated towards the longer canon. In fact, let me say quite plainly that it is not that the Catholics have one canon. We honor and we use both canon of scriptures in our theological development, in our explanation of scriptures. But we also take a preference to the Greek canon because the Greek canon also is presented in such a way that it has what we call messianic ideas. That is, it speaks about a promise and it shows the fulfillment of the promise right through that particular text. Going into the New Testament where Jesus himself um, became flesh among us. That God made a promise that he will save us and the Savior is being manifested in Matthew, for instance. Now, the Hebrew canon, one of the important theological issues there is that while it speaks about God's presence and about God walking among its people, it also speaks about God coming to inaugurate his kingdom. But the inauguration of the kingdom from the Hebrew standpoint will only take place when Elijah comes. So it ends with Cap Chronicles, encouraging people to be engaged and to prepare themselves and to work. And we also have the prophets, Malachi, ending with the words, Come Elijah. Now, in the Greek canon, we go beyond that. Not just do we say, come Elijah. In fact, we say, Elijah has come in John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, I am not the one, but there is someone coming after me. I am not fit to undo his sandal. And when he comes, John sent a messenger to ask, are you the one or am I to look for someone else? And he said, you go and tell John what you see. The sick is healed. The eyes of the blind are open. He said, the dead are raised to, to life. And the good news is proclaimed to everyone. So we have fulfillment. We have promised fulfillment as a strong theological team not the only, but an essential um, team in the use of the Greek canon. Promise and fulfillment in Jesus. Those are very important uh, points you've just made, Father Vibert. And it reminds me that when I take the Hebrew Bible, so the Bible written in Hebrew for the Jewish people, it ends really with the book of Chronicles and yes. people are looking towards the land. Yes, yes. Because there's also a theme in scripture of exile and return, being out of the land, being back in, into the land. Yeah. And the Christian um, scriptures, so when Christians pick up their scriptures, so the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Testament would end with the book of the prophet Malachi. Prophets um, make um, 
prophecies about the one to come, and they therefore seek their fulfillment in the New Testament. And that's so Christians see um, the old being fulfilled mm -hmm. in the new. Yes. Um, so I think we would just conclude here um, by making some reference to, to Synod. Yes. Um, Synod 2014 is happening in Barbados in <clears throat> a week's time. Synod 2015 will take place in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in January next. Um, is there some word of encouragement that you'd like to give to us in relation to the Word of God <clears throat> and the use of the Word of God? So the Holy Father has already emphasized the prominence of the Word of God in all activities. The Word of God in the past has been used as just a reference. We may read it and we may just say a few things and then um, we go on to other business, except when it has been proclaimed in the assembly. The Word of God has to become that animating power in our lives, in the Christian community and in our families. In the Christian community, in every aspect of an engagement, the Word must be a priority as part of the agenda, not just an appendix to our meeting. If we are engaging in the service of the Lord in His church, we must listen to the Master and hear what He is saying. Therefore, it means we must spend time, quality time, during our meeting so that the Lord Himself will set the pace for what He is asking us to do. It is true that we will get our motivation will get our strength and renewed energy because he is the engine, he is the power behind what we are engaging in his work. Secondly, scripture um, must be encouraged to become part of the sanctuary of our homes. In fact, we must create sanctuaries. There are some people who have little, little altars and so on. They have perhaps the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary of the crucifix. That is a good thing. But it is not enough. The scripture, as it is enthroned in our, our chapel or in our churches, must find a home within our home. In other words, God's word must be incarnate in the lives of our home so that when we get up in the morning, the word is there and we can go to that sacred place, that sacred sanctuary in our home and listen to the word, hear God, and we can move out into our everyday activity knowing that we have been renewed. So the word of God must permeate in our church, in our families. Our families must create um, sanctuaries for the word and the word must also become part of our lives, that it animates us and motivates us so that we become more and more like Christ and that we change our lives and our life's pattern. We walk the road with the Lord, accompany him with the Lord, and so bring about conversion through proclaiming by our lives. It is only so can we change, bring change internally and externally both in our lives and around our lives and also in the society in which we are called to be engaged. And of course, we really cannot have a proper new evangelization unless the family is evangelized. Amen. So having the word enthroned in family homes, having sanctuaries in our homes, having a sacred space yes. where we listen to God, where we speak to God is very essential. Yes. Thank you for sharing the word, thank you for engaging in conversation on the word of God. Thank you, Father Mike, and, and thank you especially for sharing um, your experience of the encounter with your grandmother and how she taught you. And I think we need to have many more grandparents and parents doing this to their children so that the world can become part of our lives. Thank you so much. Thy word is
Is a lamp unto my feet. 